So it's a pleasure to have with us uh, Dr. Marisol Suengas. She is the head of the Melanoma Group and Dean for Academic Affairs at the Spanish National Cancer Center, CENIO, in Madrid. She's also the vice president of the Spanish Association uh, for Cancer Research. Um, the work in the lab of Marisol has a clear aim to translate the basic research in melanoma into the clinics by identifying novel tumor markers in, and drug targets. And her work has been seminal in understanding the biology of melanoma, and, and particularly for metastasis. She has also been involved in the spin-off of this technology uh, to be able to have a, a practical use in, in different companies. And her work has been recognized by different awards, just to mention a couple. The Outstanding Research Investigator Award by the Melanoma Research uh, Association, the Fritz Anders Medal of the European Society for Pigment Cell Research, etc. In addition to her uh, career as a scientist, she has been also involved in an important task that is fostering and empowering women, women in science. And it's something that all of us believe here, and, and this is the, the way to go. In this, in this work, she has been recognized by the L'Oreal Award, the Elsa Medrano Award, etc. But she's not here for, for that, she's here for her research, and we're very happy to, to have her here to talk about immune suppressive pathways in cancer by life imaging or metastasis. Thank you very much, Marisol. Okay, so thank you very much, Manel, for the, for the introduction. Uh, what Manel didn't say, is that we met a long time ago when we were like kids almost. <laughs> we were uh, uh, postdocs and we have a paper together. So that was a long time ago. So I'm going to share my screen now and uh, just to get started. I'm not sure. Can you see my screen? Hopefully. So can you see my screen? Because I don't see anybody. Hope so. Okay, so um, I thought to start with this, um, uh, this slide, hold on, uh, that is, uh, well, you have very nice, uh, of course, uh, lighthouses in, in Catalonia, but uh, this one, this one is from um, my hometown, so this is La Colonia, this is the Hercules Tower, this is the long-standing, um, like, a high, uh, lighthouse, this is from the Roman Empire. And we're very proud of it in, in La Colonia, but uh, I show it here just to, as, as kind of an example of, of, uh, of what is coming in this talk. So uh, this uh, Hercules Tower uh, has been used to shed light uh, to the sailors, and I hope that you, uh, at least when you leave this presentation, you understand how in our group we are trying to visualize uh, early stages of uh, melanoma progression, so actually a pre-metastatic niche. And uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, mostly melanoma. You will see that the data that uh, we found in terms of new um, drivers of metastasis and modulators of the immune system, they are applicable to other uh, cancer types. And I'm going to show you a model that, uh, sorry, I think. Yeah. So it's a um, uh, mouse model said so that uh, this is our MetaAlert and you will see why we call it MetaAlert. So just uh, as a disclosure, so uh, in the end of the talk, I'm going to just present some data on a compound that is now uh, under development of a company that we co-founded, Biancotech Therapeutics. Now it's Highlight Therapeutics and I will show you the clinical trials that they're doing. So it's my disclosure. So no melanoma. So melanoma so it's, it's a tumor, it's quite intriguing. So it's, it's a tumor that, of course, the, it's initiated in, in by melanocytes and melanocytes in different uh, areas, mostly in the skin. And here you see a picture of a melanoma. So you might think that it's actually quite thick, but it's not. So these are millimeters. And, and actually, melanoma has this um, peculiarity that this is the only tumor type where very thin lesions of uh, barely a millimeter or more can already um, metastasize to different uh, organs, to the lymph nodes and then to various distal sites. And uh, of course, the field has improved a lot in, in the last uh, you know, decade or so. We, it's the tumor with the largest mutational uh, burden uh, described to date. 
um, many uh, genetic and epigenetic alterations. But I would argue that uh, still we don't know, we don't know in detail how this very early on, this, uh, these tumor cells can uh, disseminate and, and actually how can we visualize this premetastatic niches. So in this context of the niche, so what we're very interested in is in the crosstalk uh, between tumor cells and the vasculature. So today I'm going to talk mostly about the lymphatic vasculature. And, and we focus on the, the lymphatic vasculature because, of course, this, uh, this uh, system, so of course, is very important for drainage, but lymphatic endothelial cells are also very secretory. And depending on the context, there can be pro or anti-tumorigenic uh, effects. So what we're interested in is in understanding how these tumor cells and, and the vasculature can get uh, activated so that uh, in the end, the immune system, instead of attacking the tumor, what it does is actually supports tumor growth. Okay, so what I'm going to show you first is a mouse model that we um, generated to visualize the process of how the, the vasculature, the lymphatic vasculature gets expanded is neolymphangiogenesis, because this is a process that was thought, thought to happen very early on, but we will, I will show you that has uh, effects at the systemic level. Now, to model. So to, to model uh, lymphangiogenesis, the lymphatic vasculature, so it's, it's not trivial. <laughs> the same way it's not trivial to, to visualize um, uh, angiogenesis, because there are many uh, inducers of this process, proteins such as VEGS, FGFs, angiopoietins, HEF, which also participate in other functions, as we know. They are multiple uh, signal receptors, and then the effectors downstream are also complicated and complex. However, within this uh, kind of um, multi-dimensional uh, uh, process, so there are some proteins in particular that are more restricted to the lymphatic endothelial cells and to the lymphatic vasculature. One of them is this protein PROX1. The other, uh, also uh, somehow uh, more restricted, is also the VEGFR3 uh, signaling cascade. And this is the one that we used for modeling. And uh, VEGFR3 is the receptor for VEGFC and VEGFD mostly. Now, just to show you the difference between PROX1 and VEGF, uh, the VEGF signaling. So PROX1 has been, uh, well, first thing is, is um, it's a transcription factor, is uh, expressed uh, during embryogenesis and then maintained in adult lymphatic endothelial cells. So that's why this has been used very actively to, um, well, the promoter of this gene to drive GFP and other fluorescent markers, and, and very important to visualize the, the vasculature, okay? Now, we chose to study the VEGFR3, and the reason is because this protein is also expressed um, in embryogenesis, but then uh, shut down uh, most in, in the lymphatic endothelial cells and on the whole body level, unless there is a pathogenic uh, situation and uh, that could be inflammation, but particular cancer. So cancer uh, cells can activate this uh, protein. And, and then it's a transcriptional activation. And so this, uh, the off and on activation is what we exploited to actually uh, follow the, the uh, activation of VEGFR3 and then lymphangiogenesis. We were very lucky, so I was first at the University of Michigan. That's how I started my, my group um, uh, several years there. And then when I moved to the CNIO, this was around uh, 2002 or so. So Sagari Ortega, who is the, she's the head of the animal models unit, she was already working on um, lymphangiogenesis and, and she was actually developing a model where um, what is interesting is that it has um, a GFP and luciferase cassette inserted after an internal ribosomic entry site in the three prime UTR of VEGFR3. That means that uh, this protein VEGFR3 is expressed normally and coupled to the expression of VEGFR3 is an independent expression of uh, GFP in luciferase. And so it was the first uh, paper demonstrated that this was uh, actually a reflection of VEGFR3. 
So then a postdoc in my group, a senior now, so David Olmeda, what he did is then to, to uh, exploit and move these um, models into um, actually to, to address melanoma. Just to let you know, see how this, uh, we could, what we could see by following GFP, you can follow the vasculature. The luciferase allows us to, to see in vivo. And actually, you see here the animals without tumors. So I told you that for 3 signaling is very low when the tumors are there, so that gets induced. So now we can do uh, many things, right? So um, using these, these animals, the, uh, so this I'm going to show you a paper that was published a few years ago, but now then I'm going to go into more recent data, okay? Just to, so you understand where do we come from in terms of the imaging. So um, of course, you can, we have animals in immune deficient and immune competent settings. The immune deficient, we can uh, implant tumor cells. We use melanomas, but if you guys or anybody is interested, so we can uh, we could implant in principle other tumor uh, types. The cells can be modified. You can overexpress. You can inactivate your genes. You can have different fluorophores. What was interesting for us um, is that uh, so here you have the the tumor. This is tumor cells that were implanted. And it was very pe peculiar and when the tumor cells are very aggressive. We could see you see here what we here what we have is now luciferous imaging, and you see these uh, colors lighting up. Well, so it's lighting up because the animal, the host, is reacting in a systemic manner uh, to tumor um, these melanoma cells. And this was very important because we know, I told you that melanomas from very early on have the ability to just shed and move. So we could see how these cells have very systemic effects early on. Not only tumor cells, we can implant uh, patient uh, derived biopsies, PDX. And again, where the PDX are very aggressive, even before we have neolymphangiogenesis activation of this light system. In, in the tumor, it's already these tumor cells are sending signals and they are getting signals activated in distal sites. These are immune uh, deficient mice to study cells. Then we have also immune competent mice, now genetically modified mice. And of course, you can imagine also your models. These are quite complex uh, um, uh, systems, so VEGFR3. In our case, in a, in a setting, a background driven by tyrosinase and inducible pre to drive oncogenic VRAF in the context of PIT and loss. So these animals develop melanomas. We have in an albino background and pigmented background because we're interested in different aspects of pigmentation and so on. But again, also you can see how the tumors, so then, uh, so this uh, topical administration of tamoxifen and also then systemic induction of uh, lymphangiogenesis. So that is, uh, so then we could do more things with these animals. So, and the question was like, so in the clinic, uh, if a patient comes with melanoma, so what's gonna happen is the, the tumor is gonna be removed. And then um, for some patients, this may be too late and then maybe relapse, okay? And so we wanted to, to model, uh, to address this, or to use these animals to see if we could actually uh, visualize not only how the tumors get initiated, but also how do they relapse. And we had an, a question that we wanted to address is that we have this situation. This situation is uh, here melanomas are implanted. You see it's a pigmented lesion. In the bottom part, what you see is now, um, so how the, this Lucifer is better for three activating. And see you, as I mentioned, it's always a systemic process. So the first question was, okay, what happens if we remove the tumor, okay? And so we had two possibilities. One is that the signals still remain because there were tumor cells at that time and point already there, but we chose to study kind of early events. So the other question was, well, maybe, uh, so we remove the, the tumor and the, the signal went away. So what this was happened. So here you see it was a surgery. And what happened after surgery is actually most of this uh, lightning. So the, the GFR3 signal, so just almost uh, disappeared. And so what you see is almost the, the scar area. So that told us that at early stages, so the tumor was actually an implanted tumor actively driving and needed to drive this uh, VEGFR3 signaling. And then we waited and then, because these cells are very aggressive. And so what you see in the upper part 
is that now this relapse, and not only you have a pigmented lesion, non-pigmented lesion, so you know how melanoma are very heterogeneous and aggressive. What was, um, I mean, in, um, an added advantage of our animals is that before we could detect um, so macroscopically and, and, and we could actually image the, the tumor, the relapse, the animals already had uh, activated neonifangiogenesis. And so every time and before the, the uh, relapse occurred, we had activation of um, VEGFR3. And, and we know um, lymphangiogenesis because, of course, we look at the lymphatic vasculature. And that's why we call these animals uh, metalert. And uh, with the idea of uh, having a reporter where we could actually uh, visualize the process. And then we had to do a lot of actually work to demonstrate that we see actually signal before the, the tumor cells get activated in the to form uh, macrometastasis. So now long story short, so of course I told you that we have these mice, we can implant cells, PBX, and we have these genetically modified mice. And then the question was, okay, and so what are the signals um, that they get activated in these sites that we have demonstrated that they are pre-metastatic? So we started um, just with a very simple model and then we went into patients. But starting was with uh, cell lines and then we tested cell lines with different um, potential to activate this uh, distal um, lymphangiogenesis. We did proteomics uh, to see what they were secreting and we did prote total proteomics, I mean, in the soluble and also in exosomes, okay? Here I show you the uh, total, I mean, the, the secreted uh, factors. So one of the proteins that we found that was um, more uh, overexpressed in this year, comparing um, uh, non-metastatic and metastatic uh, uh, cells, was this protein called midkin. Now, and midkin was very interesting. If you Google it right now, <laughs> you will find uh, lots of papers. And uh, so this protein is actually, it's a growth factor. And um, it was described to, to bind um, many receptors, um, PTPs, so the integrins, ALK, NOTCH, LRP1. So important in, so actually used because it's a secreted protein uh, to, to address aspects of melanoma, or oh, sorry, of um, tumor metastasis in, in breast cancer and other uh, tumor types. There were no data on melanoma, however, and there was no data on, on pre-metastatic niche and no data on lymphangiogenesis, so that's why we decided to, to study this in more detail. And uh, so here I'm, I'm just summarizing in a lot of data, so you can see more uh, information in, in the paper. Because so what we found is that aggressive melanoma cells secrete this protein midkin, and the secretion is very important. If you look at TCGA and the RNA, we would have never found it because the RNA is not what makes a difference. What makes a difference is the ability of tumor cells to secrete the proteins. And so if they are very secretory, they are more aggressive. And, and so you have a midkin secreted, and then we found that midkin actually um, so it's accumulated in the context of the vasculature, the lymphatic vasculature, proximally and actually at these distal sites, and then it has two sets of effects. On the one hand, it's promoting, and we describe through an mTOR signaling, transactivate VEGFR3, and then uh, promote sprouting and lymphangiogenesis. And uh, on the other hand, was also to favoring effects on the tumor. So the, the, the tumor for metastasis, the tumor cells have to move, they have to intravasate, they have to extravasate. And this was favored also by Mitkan and we show uh, related to raw rack kinases. So two functions, and this was the first paper that we have. Of course, now comes the, the new data. So being a secreted factor, and, and being I told you that the context of lymphatic cells and tumor cells, you can have an um, uh, system, so immunomodulatory functions, we decided to study those. Ah, sorry, and now you can understand why I told you, oh, this is a joke I had for you guys. So, so why do we call, um, so the uh, Hercules Tower, Hercules Tower to this uh, model, because we can see uh, the metastasis. Anyway, so uh, in terms of the immune uh, system, 
So now in the immune system, so I don't have to tell you, uh, so why is this important nowadays in, in many uh, solid tumors and different pathologies, very uh, important. The, uh, what one would want in terms of therapy is to have sensitive tumors, meaning tumors that uh, you have uh, high infiltrate um, of um, cytotoxic uh, CD8 T cells, macrophages in an um, anti-tumoral format, and other antigen presenting cells. However, uh, melanomas, and this is also for other tumor types, we know that that's typically not the situation, or not always. And uh, so we have tumors that can be deserted, meaning that they cannot recruit immune cells. Then there are tumors that they are, these immune cells are excluded. Um, and then other settings that I would think, or, or I, I, not I would think, is like they are less understood. And this is a situation where if you look histologically, you would see an inflammated tumor, inflamed tumor, meaning that there are lots of immune cells there. But these immune cells, are now rewired. And so there are tumor associated macrophages, um, the, the other myeloid cells with suppressive features, dysfunctional T cells, uh, T Rex. And, and so the question that is in the field is okay, so what drives these different um, scenarios? And uh, particularly this one. And I'm going to tell you now, this is like a summary of the talk. So, Midkind indeed is in working in this uh, last. Um, kind of a setting of rewired uh, immune system. How did we find this? So I told you that um, what was important first in the first paper, we described the secreted um, secretion of midkin. So then we, we decided to look at the downstream uh, signaling cascades modulated by this protein. To look at downstream, the way we did is to look at now the effect on the transcriptome on the uh, first tumor cells and then patients. So we did uh, gain of function, meaning starting with isogenic cell lines that do not express and then we overexpress midkind. And then uh, cells, they expressed midkind, but we suppressed it. Did RNA-seq, got, uh, so looked at the changes in gene expression and then uh, mine uh, the TCGA, so the large uh, repositories of uh, the cancer genome atlas, melanoma, so in this case 450 um, patients. And then the question was, could we stratify or could we identify patients that recapitulated either the loss or the gain, the gain or the loss of function of it? And this is what we got, actually. Um, so to me, one of the highest p-values that we could ever uh, imagine, even. So we could uh, separate, and this is now uh, so patients that recapitulate the loss of function or, or the gain of function, and then we could separate the, the patients actually in different categories. Then we focused on the high and the low uh, midkin associated signatures, uh, patients with these signatures. This, uh, and then from there, we could now uh, see what was the, the survival uh, features and, and what was uh, actually to, uh, we found is that the patients that have uh, this mid kind high associated gene expression signature have a much poorer prognosis than one with this uh, low. This was in melanoma. And uh, of course, because I told you that mid is uh, secreted in other cancer types. So then we looked and then uh, the other TCGA data sets. And then we found that the yoma, the oblastoma, kidney renal, renal uh, clear cell carcinomas, lung squamous carcinomas, in all these cases, we could uh, separate patients and we could separate also uh, different uh, survival uh, profiles. So we think in conclusion that this protein, uh, midkin has um, uh, definitely a prognostic uh, factor in different uh, tumors. Now, more in terms of downstream effects. So now having these two uh, different patient cohorts uh, with the low and high midcan signature. So what you see here, every, every vertical line is a patient, okay? And then horizontal are genes and, and pathways. So we found that, so the patients did not only had a different prognosis, they were transcriptionally different as well. We don't know epigenetic, eh? I mean, uh, that uh, might, we might have to look, but transcriptionally, at least, so they have a different uh, immune system, the extracellular matrix, metabolism, and, and other signaling cascades. 
Of course, now at the moment we saw the immune system, so then we look more in detail. And then we found that there are differences uh, in innate and adaptive immunity, cytokine signaling, and, and uh, so on. So, of course, then now, once we have this, a very, I mean, uh, such a distinct uh, group of patients, so we, uh, we decided to first look into different immune cell types and different pathways that it could be also uh, explaining the, this behavior. And uh, so first was the convolution, so using uh, computational uh, strategies to, to address signatures. And what was, uh, so we found that these patients with the mid kind of high um, expression profile had also enrichment in TGF beta signatures, which as you know, is very complex, but uh, also can mediate um, immune suppression. We also looked for many different uh, immune cell types and uh, we found a particular enrichment of macrophages. Here you see also the macrophage signature, very enriched um, expression in the patients with this midkind high signature. Then histologically, we validated, uh, here you see histology in, in brown, the tumors, the melanoma uh, tumors, if you see them brown, they have also more uh, macrophage uh, infiltration with this marker that you see here, CD163. So next was then to define a little bit uh, more uh, mechanism. So before it was just correlation, so the high mid kind, high uh, immune uh, or macrophage presence. So now the question is, is this important and, and what were the underlying uh, cascades? First, we started with uh, simple xenograft uh, models, immune competent mice, implanting uh, cell isogenic lines uh, without or with mid kind. Then we stained, and then uh, here you see in green, this is mid kind. Mid kind is secreted, so you see in an extracellular matrix. And then we started looking at various markers of immune features. Particularly here, you see arginase 1, and so you see in red, lots of red cells uh, in these tumors, they have high mid kind. And arginase 1 in mice is an indicative of uh, immune suppressive uh, myeloid cells. We did flow cytometry to show that indeed. Um, the, the tumors with high mid kind, they had a uh, high arginase one, and then looking at a lot of markers, and um, basically Li6 uh, C positive, F480 positive, so macrophages. And then we demonstrated also the macrophages were important because we depleted these cells. Now, very briefly, I'm going to show you in a cartoon with little uh, data just how we dissected uh, more in detail the, the, the functions. And then, so first, we show you that mid kind, so we have the melanoma cells, and we wanted to know what happens and what the action was in the macrophages. First, looking at arginine uh, 1. And then, what uh, we found is that actually, just uh, adding uh, midcan, the soluble midcan was able to transactivate to favor the activation of arginine. So direct, uh, so basically uh, an effect on the transcriptional program. Then we look further, not only on, on uh, just uh, arginase, but in general in the whole uh, secretome. And there, what we found, and uh, this was through um, proteomic analysis in tumor cells in macrophages and also in the um, secreted uh, fraction. So we found here you see it's a complex uh, network. Uh, so the bottom line is that we found many uh, immune modulatory factors uh, whose expression is uh, modulated by midkind, including TGA beta, CCL2, 3, IL6, and so on, interconnected through uh, NF kappa B and TNF. And, and so this is what we think is important to uh, create an immune uh, tolerant phenotype in macrophages. The question then was, and what, what is the outcome? So what do these macrophages that are educated by, by uh, midkind and the midkind uh, secretome do? So what happens is then we look into CD8 T cells and uh, so looking at the different expression profiles, we found that um, in the presence of, so when uh, these um, tumor cells educate macrophages, CD8 T cells become dysfunctional. And this is a very complex process, but there are various genes that you can see 
uh, and they are enriched in this uh, signature that was recently described in T cell. This is um, this function in exclusion, but we found this function in D. It's not that they're excluded, it's that they are not functional in the tumors. And now, of course, this is quite important because the moment that you have uh, tumor macrophages in a pro-tumorogenic mode, the uh, CDAT cells are not killing. So what happens is that uh, so the tumor cells don't die and they can accumulate. And this, of course, has implications for therapy. And then we looked more in detail. Now is with patients, patients that had this um, mid-kind high uh, profile. So you see in red. Most of them also with very high p-value had a dysfunctional T cell dysfunctional score, and they were part of non-responders to immune checkpoint um, blocking. So, and then, okay, so that was like super exciting. And then we went to demonstrate that. And we demonstrated uh, indeed more directly in, in mouse models. So here, what we have is a different setting. So what we have instead of having midkind, what we do is not having midkind. And so, if, uh, so here you show you the growth curves of uh, tumors where uh, mimas implanted with the control. Melanoma cells, very aggressive, we have to sacrifice them. If they don't have midkind, they survive a bit better. Pretty much like when you treat with an anti-PD-1 treatment. So these are immune competent animals, of course, that we are working with. But then the uh, combination of depleting midkind and treating with anti-PD-1, now we have a much sustained uh, effect and, and better survival. We depleted by um, shRNAs, but also by uh, pharmacological inhibition of this protein. And now that we have this, so the, the animals, so basically the combination of anti-PD-1 and, and uh, mid-candifrid depletion inhibition are better survival. And uh, so we look more in detail again, so more like uh, in depth in the what happens to so what, what, why this this uh, additive or this cooperative effect. And uh, we did this by looking now at the RNA sequencing by RNA sequencing RNA seq of uh, implanted tumors with as, uh, transduced with a control SH or with midkind uh, SH RNA, so depleted from midkind, and then treated with a control antibody or with anti PD1 antibody. And uh, you see a lot of red here, and the red is um, many genes that were particularly induced by the combination of these two agents. Now, what was induced is an interferon uh, associated program. So instead of a TGF beta suppressive microbiome, now you have an interferon response when the macrophages are now uh, so basically attacking the tumor. And then we had and we demonstrated, we have a T cell infiltration and we also showed this uh, histologically. So now the process is now different. So when midcan is not there, when midcan is there, you have suppression and when of the immune system. When we inactivate it, we have a situation where we have a priming um, of the immune system. So now macrophages can get activated and CD8 T cells uh, just kill. And then, of course, this was in, in mouse. So we went again back to patient uh, derived signatures. And what we found is that, um, a, well, basically comparing the signatures that we had in mice with, with uh, five, in the, well, actually six. Uh, cohorts of patients treated with anti-PD-1 um, that modulated gamma interferon or with the anti-PD-1 CTL4 um, combination in checkpoint locate. In all these cases, in with very nice um, uh, enrichment scores, we found that these patients that respond well now to therapy are patients that had uh, the signatures that we would expect in the absence of midcan. So in, in short, what we have is that when midcan is uh, depleted, we have a better response or downregulated, a better response to um, patient uh, therapy in patients. This was melanoma. Again, back to other tumor types. So we found this midkind high uh, expression signature in macrophages, also uh, with TGL beta in lung, uh, glioblastoma, and kidney uh, renal carcinoma, so more uh, general effect. So concluding for this part, uh, so what we have is a situation where uh, tumors 
And then we found that in the context of the vasculature I show you, they express a secret midkind creating an NF kappa B TGF beta uh, background where now immune cells are rewired. And so you have infiltration, but infiltration of uh, tumor uh, associated macrophages, protomergenic. Um, and then dysfunctional T cells. We're also working on uh, MBSCs and, and TYs. The other way around, when you deplete, so what we have is an interferon uh, primed uh, background where now there's a better response. And interferon is very important because it's one of the best indicators of response to immune checkpoint blockade in patients, at least in, in Nevada. And uh, so we had um, a paper was in medicine, in nature medicine, and this is the cover. And this is the cover uh, from the mother, actually, of the first author. She is an artist, and this is the way she interpreted the, the paper when she told her. So this is uh, here you have a macrophage. The macrophage has two sides. This is one side where it has here like uh, killing the tumor cells that in a very bad shape. And uh, but and this is when midkind is not there. When midkind is there, you have now like blooming uh, macrophage, a bad one, that actually supports the, the tumor. So you want more detail, you can see. But it was nice to see how non-scientists interpret science and can give also uh, you know, an artistic view to it. And I have, I think, uh, about uh, five more minutes or, or so before we finish. Because I, I know that many of you are interested in drug response, so I don't have time to show you all the data. Those of you that are interested, we can go in more detail. But just I wanted to, to tell you that we can use this uh, VEGFR3 uh, reporter mice, of course, to now treat and treat with various drugs. We can treat with uh, immune checkpoint blockers. Here you see how a uh, very sick, uh, well, an animal that has this VEGFR3 signaling lighting up can be reduced. We have also, um, we can work with um, BRAF, MEC inhibitors, you have bedmiafenib. And then, just briefly, because I'm going to show you how we're looking at different compounds, we found one, and uh, this is the BO110, that completely uh, shut down the, this VEGFR3 signaling. This compound, we were very interested in it because we had reported, um, like, uh, years back that is is um, kind of a if you see a simple agent is a long double stranded rna a poly -AC, this is not uh, so it's a series of inosine and cytosine that have been used for many many years as an immune uh, inducer but uh, a long rna is is very unstable and it was degraded so we were able to couple and, and protect it in a way with a carrier, polycationic carrier, so that it could get inside the cells and then activate a, a process of such degradation. We had published this years back. But what was, and, and just to super simple, how does this work? This compound you see from is 110 is because of uh, the size of the, the particles. They get incorporated in tumor cells more efficiently than in other normal cells, activating uh, sensors of helicases and then promoting um, like um, activation of uh, endocytosis and endosomal trafficking and, uh, and autophagy, finally, caspases activated. This was what, what was published, okay? And so what then what we found, um, and this was the basis of this uh, company, I will show you later, Beyond Protect Therapeutics, but our animals uh, so told us that this drug had other effects. And um, so the, the, so just one, and this was very actually super exciting, one single dose of uh, BO110. So 110, remember, I remind you the size, BO is from the Unprotect, okay? Um, and so you have no signal, and then four doses more is now then a reduction of tumor growth, and then we see immune competent and immune deficient uh, settings. Mechanistically, uh, we found because it was only just one single dose inhibiting uh, lymphangiogenesis, as before the tumor cells even died and had this autophagy that I show you. So we thought that it had to be something uh, affecting uh, that this compound would affect the key. Uh, core of uh, lymphangiogenesis and told you that was VEGFR3 and then the new data that we had on midkind. 
And this is what we set to study. And of course, we wanted to know if there was also effects on the immune system. So uh, first, uh, looking at uh, levels of VEGFR3 and midkind. So by RNA, we did in cells and also in tumors. So the moment we have uh, cells or tumors treated with uh, this is uh, RNA. So we would treat with uh, the one sensors, no, really strong reduction of uh, midkind RNA and uh, VEGFR3 mRNA. A lot of studies to look at promoters and, and both the genes and what could be common. And then we found an interferon now again uh, modulating, but now it's interferon uh, controlling the, the repression of these proteins. And we demonstrated that interferon was very important because when, uh, so I told you, so it's a figure where you have uh, midkind inhibited by BO110. When we block interferon, now there's the rescue of expression. So the situation now is very in, uh, interesting. So we have a compound that on the one hand attacks tumor cells, that it has effects on the lymphatics, and they have now activation of interferon. And interferon mobilizes a lot of uh, immune cells, as I mentioned before, creating hot tumors. And we found indeed that just uh, the treatment uh, with uh, here is BO110 alone, okay, so we have a mobilization of a lot of uh, immune uh, cells. And um, we wanted to, to look at effects on, on tumor relapse. And uh, when we treat, told you before, if we don't, so we remove the tumors, we don't treat, the tumors come back. And then it's this lighting up of our models. If we treat, and this is the treatment with PR110, so there's, there's no signal, there's no relapse. Um, and very efficient, so very, very, and just three doses, okay, and just very good and sustained uh, response. So with this, we conclude that uh, we have a compound that can actually prevent uh, tumor relapse after uh, surgery. With all this data, uh, so the company Biomcotech was created. Now it's a uh, highlight therapeutics. The company, and this is just the merit of the company. I'm not involved in this. They, they are, it's not my expertise, but one of the happiest moments in my life where when they started uh, clinical trials, not with bo 10 with a derivative that the company uh, generated is bo 112 And these have many uh, so various uh, hospitals involved in different uh, tumor settings. But here you see it's a patient and they are treating patients that are actually resistant uh, well, so different types of treatment, particularly uh, in this case was nivolumab, so anti pd one And uh, for those of you that are in the clinic, uh, so, so you have a tumor here and then it's a very nice response. And of course now this is in uh, phase two uh, clinical trials and, and uh, we'll hope to, to have uh, good uh, results. But this is for the students that are looking at uh, the, uh, or watching the seminar, is that you can sometimes in life happens that you can go from uh, uh, basic uh, research to a translational research. And that's it, this is my final slide. Um, just starting with a model um, that uh, lights on and off, we can, uh, we found midkind, we found effects on um, the phantogenesis, um, effects also on motility, and all the effects that I show you in the context of the immune system. How can we rewire and re-alter this with a compound? We have here a Swiss army knife because it has effects on the tumor, the vasculature, and the immune system. And that's pretty much it, just the, the group. Um, a lot of uh, people involved, I uh, mentioned before, Sagari Ortega started the MICE, and then Daniela Cerezo and David Olmeda driving this process, lots of collaborators at the University of uh, Zurich, um, uh, Mitch Levesque, Raul Rabadana at Columbia University, our funding agencies, and one of the Research Alliance, and, and uh, so on. And with that, so I'll be glad to, to take any question that you might have. So I think I'm going to probably stop sharing the, this screen. So thank you. Thank you, Marisol. So that was excellent, very good. And a lot of topics from the very basic to the, to the company and to the clinical trials. So I didn't get too much because sometimes you want to pack a lot of things, but I wanted to give you a, like a 
a view of what you can do in terms of gene Don't discovery. Worry. I am faster, you know. This is, this is okay. It was very good. That was very good. So I'm trying to put together the questions, in fact, here. Um, let's just start uh, with this one. Do you expect that um, midkind has an effect not only in macrophages but also in T cells? Yes. Yes. So the question is, is very um, relevant because I told you that's a secreted protein. So um, we know that also the, the effects on, on it has effects on both of them, but uh, it is effects just on, on T cells, but the effects are much stronger in the context of macrophages. So what we think is actually midkind is creating a microenvironment uh, where macrophages are in a protumeral mode, I told you, it's an arginase, this is actually affecting the, the metabolism and the biology of uh, T cells, so they get activated. So there might be some direct effect, but I think we think it's a coordinated effect, not only in CD8 T cells, dysfunctional, but also on T rex that they get induced. So in that uh, together, we think that's why we have a very strong immune tolerance like that. Second one is, what are the factors that regulate the secretion of midkind? Mm -hmm. The secretion of midkin. I wish I knew all, but <laughs> so no. We it's, it's a complicated protein. It's a complex protein because I told you that it has first thing uh, different um, receptors that binds to it. So we started decided to start downstream, but upstream we have also looked. I told you that so midkin. The name for midkin comes from mid gestation gene. It's interesting because it's expressed, it's one of these embryonal, embryonic associated genes that gets shut down later on in the adult, except in some areas. So it was more related to, so we know that the activation in the adult driven by the tumor, it has a component associated to oncogenes. We know that the PA3 kinase is very important. Uh, we know that there's some feedback loops uh, involved and also the BVAF uh, pathway. It's also responding to hypoxia. It's also responding to uh, so some growth factors as well. Okay, but yes, we still don't have the full picture of it. But it's it's quite interesting because it's every, one of these genes that is up and down, and we think it's down in part because it's the module the immune modulatory pathways attack. Thank you. Um, in the patients treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors with melanoma. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the activity of uh, midkind has been assessed to distinguish responders, not responders? Yes, so what we looked, uh, so we took, uh, we did a retrospective analysis, meaning starting from the data sets, there are now very large data sets of uh, patients treated with anti PD1 and PDL1, and then in the data sets, we found actually the midkind associated signature. Okay. It's not that much of a midkind expression RNA, but this is kind of the, the signature. And we described in the paper a series of genes that define the signature. So now what we are looking now more detail is to have independent cohorts for validation as an independent and additional uh, marker. But yes, we did look into patient material. When you talk about um, TGF beta in this context, Mm -hmm. uh, and TGF beta is involved in stemness. Do you know if midkind is also involved in stemness? Uh, markers, have you changed in OG4 and other markers? Yeah, uh, we have a collaboration ongoing uh, with uh, researchers a bit too early about this, but uh, yes, we do think there is a, a, an effect definitely, actually, on not only on stemness but actually on dormancy and getting cells out of dormancy. And this is, uh, as I hope to tell you next time you invite me. This is the next lecture, in presential one. Because yeah, yeah, it's not that the tumor cells, you know, the, the important in dormancy at late stages. So many patients relapse and so why they do. And so this is what we're interested in. And another question is one, this is one from the Sotillos lab in Germany. So what about if you mix, um, uh, BRAF inhibitors here in melanoma. BRAF are given, BRAF inhibitors and, and the immune checkpoint inhibitors, combining the midkind and BRAF inhibitors. Ah, if we combine mean that midkind and BRAF, yes, we we could. Um, so we um, 
the limitation for, for this analysis and, and it's something that we want to do. We have done in, in culture and, and so this we need to, to do more in mice. So we are generating our uh, blocking antibodies. There is an inhibitor of MITCAN, it's not very selective, I have to say. Then there's a company that uh, generated the MITCAN in uh, blocking antibodies. It's been a bit complicated to work with a company for IP issues. But uh, so that to let you know, uh, Rocio, we are generating our own blocking antibodies to do these different various combinations, of course, that we have to do. Yeah. We are, so the immune system was so key now in melanoma that yeah. we decided to start from that, but yes, that's it. Also related to this, uh, they say, does uh, midkind have a direct, direct effect on tumor cells? Yes, yes. Uh, maybe it was it's not too clear. So midkind has two, um, well, at the level that I told you, so it's an autocrine effect. The autocrine effect is on NF-kappa-B. And this is an autocrine effect that now alters the transcriptome of the cells. And, and this, if we deplete midkind, what happens is that the cells, they still grow, uh, they still form a tumor locally, but they do not metastasize. So they, they have a very impaired ability to move, they have a very impaired ability to, to alter this. Uh, so it has a, an autocrine effect, but a paracrine effect as well, because secreted. Okay. I don't want to take a lot of your time, so probably a couple of three, two, oh, three no, questions. I'm okay. Is that, is that you guys? I'm, since I'm here, <laughs> yes. uh, So one raise to the um, to the last part. So this um, compound, this double strand RNA, uh, BO110, BO112, how stable they are? Uh, how this is uh, RNA a double strand? Is this stable in the blood? So how how it works? Yes, yeah, this is an important point. So that I tried to mention. So poly AC for the people that are, are there, the immunomodulation is kind of the classical immunomodulation is still used. And the thing is that to, to get a poly AC to work in vivo, and this has been done and there are different formulations, you have to use quite high dose because it's degraded. And 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 uh, so the way and this was uh, why in the end we got the patent to go into the company, the way is protected. Is protected with polycationic carriers and forms a particle. And what the particle does is two things. One is to, to protect the RNA, which is important, but also to allow for a different uptake. And now you have an uptake in endosomes. And then the, there's a polycationic carriers. What they do is they change the, um, the pH of the endosome. And so there is activation of um, cytosolic helicases, bottom line. So by packing the long double center RNA in a particular way, not only we protect it, is that we have now a different signaling cascade, and this is cytosolic helicases, the MDA5 and so on that activate. Um, going back at the beginning of your talk, a question raised that you mentioned that uh, melanoma is special because it has um, this early dissemination with mm -hmm. not so high infiltration. So. <clears throat> What ha that happened? This is a physiological tissue context. This is a molecular. What are the molecular uh, basis for that? Yes, this is a, and this is not a trivial question to ask, because of course we know that uh, in terms of uh, risk factors that drive melanoma, right? So sun exposure, meaning uh, mutations and alterations that happen in the tumor cell. So and melanomas accumulate many many more and so uh, because the melanocytes melanocytes are cells that are really there to survive when this uh, sun exposure and dna damage happens okay keratinocytes we lose them melanocytes stay there so there is a component of aggressiveness derived directly from the ability of melanocytes to survive stress to survive uv radiation to survive a uh, reactive vaccine in the species so this is a component to it and now you have the mutations that happen, but this is also the microenvironment. And there are more and more papers uh, coming in terms of uh, this very early on, these melanocytes get activated with many mutations are uh, altering the, the microenvironment in such a way that they together favor their motility and invasion. So this ability to, to from thin lesions to metastasize are from the melanocyte itself. And so very motile, very aggressive cells, and the ability it has to rewire the microenvironment. Thank you.
So this here. Well, that is one. Great question. I, I love it. <laughs> nice. I'm trying to select some, some more technical and more general. So uh, one very precise. Have you confirmed that MedKine knockout cancer cells do not induce BGFR3 in the Med Alert mouse? Yes, 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 we did. So um, this was one the first uh, paper that we had. So. And the way we, we got into, so I told you we found it kind because in the secret tomb. So then what we did is to take cell lines that express it and we deplete it, cell lines that don't express it and activate it. So we have loss of function and gain of function. So if midkind is depleted, the tumors grow in mice, but they do not disseminate well. I don't know, it's not complete, but it's like a much reduced inhibition of the metastasis. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so let me finish with the last one that is a question in general, in general for attendees. So uh, how do you explain the, the advantages and disadvantages of, of mouse models versus cancer models in, in melanoma? So what, what they provide and what are the advantages? And this, yeah, just to show that this is relevant work that is done in mouse that can be applied, uh, as you mentioned, even in phase two trials. So just a, you know, a couple of no, minutes. Thank you for that. And uh, I would never say that the mouse model would substitute for clinical uh, patient material <laughs> that started. Now. So uh, for me, the mouse models are tools. So cell, uh, cells are tools. Um, I don't know, tumoroids uh, are tools. Uh, Xenografts, in, immune deficient and immune competent, genetically modified mice are tools. I think if, if we were only to study uh, data in, in a mouse, I think we would be very limited, of course. Th this is no doubt. So our metalerts, so what we use them, we use them as indicators of uh, aggressiveness. So uh, when I talk about this to law, lay audience, I tell them, look, we have a system is like the the total that it gets in or out, right? So what are the genes that light this process and what are the, the drugs that inhibit? And from there, we validate into patients. And I would argue for the people and then the clinicians, of course, and, and, and it has to be there. So on the other hand, if we only had the tumor data, I think it would be very complicated to define mechanisms and define kinetics, and they have defined process of relapse, right? Tumor evolution. So I could go on and on. So bottom line, I think the best is to, to combine and to integrate as much as possible. If you can, and you can pay for it, and you can get good collaborators for the clinic. Yeah. I think that with this integration message, we, we should finish here. We promise to finish at so one all happy in this. Okay. <laughs> Yes, wrapping up and, and thank you very much for the great talk and please uh, congratulate the speaker thank you very much thank you until next time mm -hmm.